So uh, an alternative approach uh, to strategic reward is a so-called best fit approach. Sometimes you'll come across this uh, as a, a contingency uh, based approach. Now the best fit approach is to take us to a slightly different uh, level of complexity uh, to the ideal type strategies. But it's the same process uh, effectively. It's just that we're saying here that there are a much broader range of strategies that organizations will have uh, access to. It might not be useful always to simply lump them together uh, as uh, a broad ideal type that organizations do more uh, com have more complex differences between them than that but it starts out and it continues more or less the same way we start out with a brick with a big questions what kind of business do we want to be in and they determine the corporate objectives of the organization those corporate objectives get translated into particular questions about how we win in particular markets our business unit uh, strategies we then think about functional levels uh, within the organization so human resource issues along with operations with finance with marketing all these broad management functions how in each business unit do those functional areas help us to win in our marketplaces so we're interested in HR strategies here what HR strategies make sense uh, in order to uh, translate those corporate and business unit strategies into practice how do we use our HR strategies to get people to perform to behave in certain ways now the particular part of HR that we're interested in is reward so how do our HR strategies get translated into strate strategic reward decisions how are they then translated into specific reward systems and how do those specific reward systems result in particular types of employee attitudes and behaviors now if we've made all of those decisions correctly specifically if we've made our original uh, decisions correctly about the kind of business that we want to be in and then followed them through in each of these steps down through business unit functional uh, uh, reward strategies then what we should be seeing uh, is that those reward systems which result in certain employee attitudes and behaviors should also result in levels of competitive advantage for our organization so that's the broad best fit uh, approach uh, to reward start from our strategy what do we want to do and we follow it through step by step to all of the elements of the business including reward and that those strategic reward decisions result in reward systems that fit our strategies that result in employee behaviors that provide us with competitive uh, advantage so how do we do this how do we formulate uh, a best fit reward strategy how do we make sense of what we should uh, be doing let's have a look at the various elements that are involved the first thing is to think about uh, the high level uh, issues uh, within the organization now uh, this includes those kind of corporate uh, strategy uh, elements uh, but it involves some other things as well that I, I want to talk about because they, they are important as well so the first step to formulate in the best fit strategy is to do uh, what we've called here uh, to, to assess the total compensation implications now what's included in that well the first thing that's included uh, are the competitive dynamics of the organization what markets uh, are we in what kind of products are we bringing uh, to the markets how do we want to uh, interact uh, with the market so all of those issues are we an innovator are we a, uh, a cost cutter are we a customer focused approach you know whatever variant of strategic approach that we're interested in pursuing those are the things that we need to understand we need to understand how our markets work we need to understand how our, what our competitors are we need to be aware of how our competitive environment functions and where we fit into it it's not simply about translating a, a market position uh, into uh, reward uh, 
uh, decisions. There are other things uh, involved as well, some of which will also have an effect on the, the competitive dynamics, but we should consider them uh, independently as well. And the first of those uh, is this next thing down in the list about the culture and the values uh, of the organisation. Organisations are different from each other. I was talking about Apple earlier, uh, and we think about the, the long-term competitors that Apple has had, typically Microsoft. Now, the culture and values of Microsoft and Apple, despite being uh, competitors in many similar markets over a, a similar period of time uh, with organizational leaders who knew each other uh, as young men and, and you know, were being in a, a, a common milieu. Despite that, the culture and values of those organizations are poles apart. Organizations are different from each other, not just because of the strategies that they employ, but because of what they are as an organization, about the kind of culture that they have, about the philosophy of the organization, about what they believe, the organization's values. Now, those cultural elements and the values of the organization must be reflected in the way that we reward people in the organization unless we want the organization to be dysfunctional, unless we want it to be kind of tearing it itself apart, unless we want people to be responding to incentives which don't reflect what the organization believes in, we need to build those culture and values into our rewards some way or uh, another. And the only way that we can build them in is to be aware of them. So we need to think through, what kind of organization is this? What do we believe in? What kind of values do we have? What kind of approach do we have to the relationship between the organisation and its employees? How do we believe that relationship should work? How is it going to function? So those core culture values issues are very important to build in at a fairly high level in the decisions that we make uh, about uh, reward system design. The third element in this list is about the context of the organisation. Uh, not the competitive context of the organization, but about the social and political context of the organization. Now, these contexts change. They change over time and they change between places. Uh, if you're doing business in the Middle East or uh, in the Far East, in China, uh, then that's a very different situation to doing business in the UK, in France, in Germany, in the US. There's a different social and political context. There are questions about the way that society functions. There are questions about social values. There are differences about the kinds of uh, restrictions that the political context uh, puts uh, upon the functioning of the organization. Is it uh, a highly regulated uh, environment or is it a very liberal uh, environment? Uh, what's the nature of uh, the workforce because of the way that society functions? Uh, you know, in some places, women aren't allowed to work. You know, how does that alter the way that we, uh, we function as an organisation? How are those issues going to get translated uh, through all of the elements uh, of the way that the organisation functions, not just uh, in terms of uh, rewards? So we need to be aware that organisations don't function in a vacuum. They function in context, and that context can have a major influence on the kinds of decisions that we can make in one place as against another. The fourth element that we need to take into account of uh, are about our employee needs. Now, uh, if we remember, uh, and always remember, that the key subject uh, that we're interested in here in designing rewards is about rewards. We are rewarding, not because you just do, but we're rewarding employees' effort. We are providing a transaction. This is the only reason that our employees come. You know, They wouldn't come if the rewards weren't there. Now, that simplifies the situation quite extensively, but that is the fundamental issue that we need to uh, respond to. 
with our reward system. What do our employees want? What do our employees need from uh, rewards? Now, obviously there's a, a kind of balance of power between organizations and their employees. Uh, and, uh, and often employees need to work somewhere. And so we, we may have a, a degree of strength in what we provide, but uh, we can't ignore the fact that unless we uh, satisfy the needs of our employees, they'll continue to look for alternatives. They'll continue to look for other places, uh, other rewards uh, in other organisations that may meet their needs. This might be even more complex uh, or certainly provide uh, a greater challenge if our employees uh, are organised collectively in a trade union. Uh, for unions uh, the world over, issues of reward are their number one priority. Issues of bargaining for rewards collectively are their number one area of activity. And so we need to be aware what their priorities are, what their agenda uh, is, uh, and to make sure uh, that we design our rewards with that in mind, not necessarily following it slavishly, but being aware that it may be subject to challenge uh, from these stakeholders. The final thing that we need to think about is how our compensation system might interact with other HR uh, systems. What we've been concerned with up till now is to see uh, the uh, design of reward systems in a fairly vertical form of, uh, of integration, uh, responding to uh, competitive needs of the organisation and other kinds of broad contextual uh, elements. Uh, we need to remember that reward is one part of a people management framework and that there are other elements of the people management framework that are, uh, that are pursuing hopefully uh, similar uh, objectives to the kinds of things that we're thinking about for our rewards. So we need to think about how uh, these can become mutually supportive, how they interact with each other uh, and provide greater value by being congruent uh, with each other. So these are the important competitive strategic decisions that we need to think about uh, first and foremost. The next stages are all about implementation. I'll talk about one uh, in some detail and then mention the, the final two uh, fairly uh, briefly. Once we've decided what our strategy uh, is going to be, uh, then we need to try to understand how uh, that strategy is going to be put in place. Uh, now this is something that we're going to focus on over the course uh, of uh, the module. Uh, and uh, the mechanisms that we have for translating uh, these strategic objectives into action are what we might call uh, four strategic reward uh, policies. Uh, and they are alignment, competitiveness, contributions, and administration. I'm going to talk about these in a little bit more detail uh, in a moment. Uh, and we'll talk about them in a lot more detail uh, as we go through uh, the individual uh, sessions uh, over the course of the module and build up uh, our policy uh, processes and the associated techniques um, uh, in order to uh, enable us to achieve our strategic objectives. But our strategic objectives are the end point. How we get to them is uh, through these uh, four strategic reward uh, policies. And we'll talk about those, like I say, uh, a little bit more uh, in a moment. We need to think about an implementation uh, strategy. Uh, you know, if we're making a change, any kind of change in an organisation, uh, then we need to make sure that we uh, we are able to uh, to put it in place. Uh, reward is a significant issue uh, when it changes in the organisation, a source uh, probably of more conflict in organisations than any other uh, element. So our implementation needs to be careful. It needs to be sensitive, uh, we need to communicate, uh, we need to market, uh, we need to involve uh, in order to make sure that our implementation uh, works and we use the kinds of techniques, not that are just good techniques to use, but also that we use techniques uh, that are uh, in line with the, uh, the kinds of strategic objectives 
uh, that we uh, that we've established to, to make sure that we've got consistency right from uh, the start the final thing that we need to do in terms of our best fit strategy is to think about uh, a, a continual monitoring uh, process uh, to reassess the closeness of the fit between what we're doing and what we would what we need to do in terms of our environment uh, and to realign uh, as our conditions and our strategy change. Now, obviously, that's easier said uh, than done. Uh, reward strategies typically don't change very often. Uh, reward practices don't typically change very often because they are substantial and important uh, and relatively fixed uh, elements of organisational life. So we might typically see organisations uh, leave uh, their reward systems to fall into some considerable state of disrepair and dysfunction before they're finally forced uh, to uh, make uh, any significant uh, change. But change should take place. Change might be difficult, it might be uh, awkward, it might be painful, uh, but uh, if we leave our reward systems to unravel uh, too much, uh, then they become an expensive disaster. And sometimes we just need to take the bull by the horn and to recognise that our conditions have changed, that our strategy has changed, and therefore we need to change our rewards to refit uh, the, uh, the strategy uh, again. So those are the four steps uh, to formulating a best fit uh, strategy. Now, I mentioned these four strategic reward uh, policies, uh, and I want to talk about them a little bit uh, uh, more uh, in detail now and to show how they fit to the development of strategic objectives. And this will also start to introduce the broad structure that we have uh, for the remainder uh, of uh, the module. Now, we start out with our strategic objectives. Now, we mentioned that uh, there are any number of strategic objectives that an organization might take, but there are some broad uh, key uh, objectives from a human point of view uh, that organisations need to think about that have particular relevance to uh, the design of a reward uh, strategy. The first is all about supporting the workflow. Now, the workflow is all about how work is done uh, in an organisation, how we design uh, the nature of work, what kind of performance uh, we want for, from our employees, whether that's productivity, whether that's quality, whether it's about work intensification or whether it's about innovation. You know, these ideas about performance, what it is, about the level of quality that's required, these things are, are common to organisations, even though the answers uh, might be very different between organisations. We need to think about the extent of flexibility and ability to change that we need to build into our organisations. Are we working in very dynamic situations? Uh, or are we working in a fairly stable environment where flexibility isn't uh, a major issue? We need to think about how important costs are to the organisation, just how uh, tenuous our margins uh, might be, about the gap between success and failure uh, for our particular organisation and what that means for how we need people to work. So workflow issues are a key set of strategic objectives that we need to take account of. The second set of strategic objectives is about fairness. Now, fairness is extremely important and cannot be overstated in terms of the objectives for our reward systems. This isn't because uh, you know, we've simply turned soft uh, and we're not being sufficiently businesslike. Uh, this isn't uh, about being touchy-feely. Fairness uh, is crucial to rewards because rewards are above all else a transaction uh, and uh, because we see that transaction in terms of at root an, an effort reward bargain then if the rewards that we offer to our employees for their effort isn't regarded as fair then there will be unfortunate consequences uh, for us as an, as an employer. It may be uh, that if employees regard the uh, rewards as being unfair that they just simply ref 
refrain from working for us. They may go and look for other employment. Even if they stay with us, they may reduce their effort in order to match the perceptions about their rewards, to even up the fairness of the effort reward uh, bargain. So they may reduce performance. They may uh, want to try and alter the other side of the, of the bargain to increase their rewards, maybe through fiddling their, uh, their expenses or through fiddling their overtime or through pilfering or whatever. All of these things stem from a perception of unfairness on the part of employees. So fairness should be built in to our strategic objectives. Otherwise, we're going to reap the rewards uh, in an unfortunate way for ourselves. The final set of strategic objectives is about compliance. Now this picks up on some of those issues we talked about on the last slide, which is about the context of the organisation. Compliance is all about compliance with the rules and regulations, the laws, uh, the policies uh, that exist in the society that we find ourselves operating uh, within. So in some places there may be minimum wage uh, legislation in some places there may not in some places there may be equality legislation uh, protecting uh, women's work or uh, work for uh, uh, ethnic minorities or, or whatever uh, there may be work uh, maybe regulations about uh, uh, about ch uh, child work uh, there may be regulations about all other kinds of uh, maximum working time and all of this kind of stuff so we need to be aware uh, of uh, our need to comply with uh, those uh, rules and regulations, otherwise we're likely to suffer something fairly unpleasant uh, as a result. Three key sets of strategic objectives, workflow, fairness and compliance. Now what tools do we have available to us? The tools that we have are these four strategic reward policies. And these strategic reward policies form the cornerstone of uh, our approach towards reward uh, in this uh, module. These strategic reward policies, which I mentioned on the previous slide, uh, alignment, uh, competitiveness, contributions, uh, and administration uh, <coughs> are formed by various techniques that we have available to us in the construction of our reward uh, uh, package. Uh, and so we'll go through these uh, one by one. So the first of our strategic reward policies is internal alignment. Internal alignment is all about the kind of internal structure that we develop uh, amongst our workforce, about the hierarchy of the workforce, about which employees are our least valued and which are our most values, uh, our most valued. Now we can build that either based on the jobs that people do, and we know that some jobs will be of higher value to the organization than others, or we can build it on competences or skills. Similarly, competences and skills will be more or less valuable to us uh, as an organization. So we need some mechanism uh, to structure jobs, skills, or competences to decide which are most valuable, which are least valuable, and where they all fit in relation to each other uh, in between. So we make use of various techniques. It might be work analysis, whether that's work analysis of jobs, of skills, or competences. We use descriptions, descriptions of jobs, descriptions of skills, competences. And we evaluate on the basis of that information which are the most or least valuable, either through an evaluation scheme or through some kind of certification mechanism. And so using those techniques, we achieve an internal structure, whether it's a job-based structure or a skill or competence-based structure, which provides us with a hierarchy so that we can determine who are the who are the which are the positions in the organization to be most or least highly valued the most or least highly rewarded uh, in relation to each other once we've determined where our people sit against each other within the organization we need to kind of put a price on that value now it is possible to do this without reference to 
the marketplace, uh, particularly in unionized settings, uh, often these kinds of valuations are taken simply through uh, collective bargaining, through a process of uh, uh, respective strength uh, and through negotiation. <clears throat> but organizations might typically want to make some judgment about the value of jobs or skills or competencies against each other uh, by reference to uh, the marketplace. So we use various techniques. We define our markets. Where do we need to find these particular types of jobs or skills or whatever? Uh, which markets are we competing in? And then to gather market intelligence about what similar jobs, uh, similar skills, similar competencies might receive in terms of rewards uh, out there in those markets. We gather that intelligence through pay surveys. We then decide how competitive we want to be in respect of those markets and we construct policy lines. Do we want to be very competitive? Do we want to pay at the top end of the market? Do we want to pay at the bottom end of the market and pay low? Do we want to simply meet the market rate so we don't suffer uh, disadvantages uh, compared to uh, most of our uh, competitors? So our external competitiveness policies incorporates those kinds of techniques to translate our internal job, skill or competence structure into a pay structure. And that's the point of that particular policy, uh, uh, that particular strategic reward policy. The third strategic reward policy is about the contribution of individual employees. The first two strategic reward policies, alignment and competitiveness, tends to group uh, the people in our organisation together, either in terms of jobs or in terms of skill sets or competencies. Uh, but we know, we know that common, common sense tells us, and we know anyway, uh, that not all employees are the same. Some employees are good, some employees uh, are bad, some employees are more experienced than others. And so we might want to treat employees differently than uh, each other. And so we might want to start to build incentive programs uh, in order to allow uh, our rewards to differentiate between people who might be doing the same job or who might have the same broad sets of skills or competencies. So we might put in place a seniority uh, based uh, progression system so that as people stay with the organization longer, uh, then their rewards will uh, increase and improve because we value their experience. We value their commitment, their loyalty. Or we might decide that it's going to be a performance-based approach so that uh, uh, if someone performs particularly well, whether they're uh, very experienced or not, then that performance will be uh, rewarded. And we'll use various merit guidelines in order to make sure that we use these kinds of processes consistently uh, and fairly uh, in order to uh, uh, in order to make sure that we don't uh, provide a, a, a sense of injustice uh, to employees. The final strategic reward policy is administration. Now we're not going to spend too much time talking about this uh, in uh, the module, but this is about how uh, we make the, uh, the, the, the system run on a day-to-day -day basis, how we evaluate its success, how we communicate schemes, how we budget for the reward system, and how we plan uh, for changes. So this is the structure of what we're going to do uh, on the employee reward elements uh, of this uh, module. What I want to finish off uh, by doing is to look at uh, the week uh, by week requirements uh, of the module and for you to be able to see uh, what you need to do in order to be successful uh, on the module. So you can see what we have here is a timeline. And this timeline sets out all of the various features uh, of the module. The lectures, the practical workshops, uh, the work that you need to do outside uh, of class, uh, in your groups, 
uh, as you move towards uh, the achievement of the assignment uh, on this uh, module. Now, just a word about uh, the assignment. The assignment's quite different uh, from the kind of things that you might uh, have done uh, previously. Uh, and it's useful to, uh, to, to pay a little bit of attention to that uh, before we start uh, thinking about the, the detail. Uh, the assignment uh, on the module is about, or certainly includes, the construction of uh, a reward strategy with associated strategic reward policies uh, for a case study organisation. Now we're going to start uh, working on that case study organisation in about a week. Um, uh, the case study is relatively detailed uh, and one of the things that's distinctive uh, about uh, this particular module is that you will be working at a level of detail which is similar to the kinds of things that real organisations will do in the construction of their own uh, reward uh, practices. So all of the things that we cover uh, in these uh, sessions uh, provides you with the knowledge that you need uh, in order to make decisions about this particular case study organisation and to start to construct the reward objectives and the strategic reward policies that that organisation needs in order to have an effective and useful reward system available uh, to it. Now this is going to be a group project and it's a group project for one very simple reason. The assignment is extremely difficult. It's extremely onerous in terms of the amount of time that you will have to spend on it. This isn't the kind of assignment that you can leave until the last couple of weeks of semester and then hope to pull it all off uh, in one go. This is something that we're going to be working on right the way through the semester. So there's lots of contact time available to you uh, to work together uh, with uh, a tutor available uh, on hand to provide you with guidance and advice. But outside of that, you will have to work together in your groups to, to get to grips with the detail uh, that you will need to get to grips with in order to make sensible, informed and useful decisions about the various elements of the design of the reward uh, strategy. So, having given that short overview, let's have a look at what this means uh, in practical terms uh, from week uh, to week. So we start out with the session uh, that, we've, uh, that we're in the middle of now, uh, the introduction to uh, to reward uh, about what's involved uh, and so on. Uh, now, uh, immediately following uh, this session, uh, you need to get together uh, in uh, your teams. Now, the teams have been allocated, but you need to meet up uh, and to start to develop your group uh, dynamic. You're going to rely on each other an awful lot in this module as a team. And so you need to think about the various strengths and weaknesses that team members might have. Um, there are various elements involved uh, in this uh, assessment, some of which require uh, good writing skills, good expression uh, of language, some of which uh, will require much more numerical uh, skills. Sometimes uh, you'll need someone who's got very strong organisational skills to start to pull the various bits and pieces uh, of uh, the uh, project uh, together. Sometimes you'll need uh, somebody who can assign uh, roles, who can uh, divide up the work uh, effectively. So think about your strengths and weaknesses. Think about the various roles that are going to be required within your group and think about how you're going to work together. Group work is always a challenge uh, because you've got very different people coming together. You've got people with different skills, people with different levels uh, of motivation. So you need to think about how you can overcome some of those weaknesses by establishing some clear ground rules. So you know uh, right from the start what's going to be expected of everybody within the team. Now, because of the, uh, the, uh, the challenge 
of group work and because of the potential uh, for some people to maybe try and free, free ride on the work uh, of others, uh, you're going to be able to appraise uh, the work of each other uh, in terms of uh, their contribution uh, to uh, the assessment. Uh, and that will be taken uh, into account uh, when I assign marks uh, for uh, the assessment uh, at the end of the module. Now you need to think about this right at the start and think about how the ground rules uh, that you put in place will inform the way that you appraise each other's uh, contribution. So it might be uh, that you decide uh, that you're going to have certain requirements for attendance at group meetings. And that if you if people don't attend then that will be something that will be indicated on the appraisal that you make of each other whatever it is that you want to do you need to establish some ground rules which, ground rules which are going to help your uh, team uh, to function uh, and to make sure that people play uh, an equal role uh, or certainly a fair role uh, within uh, the team and that we don't have uh, free riders The other element uh, of uh, the module uh, is something that you'll find on, on Blackboard. Uh, like I said, uh, the content, knowledge of uh, the uh, module will be delivered through this type uh, of session. Uh, but uh, you need to make sure as individuals uh, that you are clear about your understanding of the subject as you work your way through it. Now, there are no particularly difficult aspects uh, of the subject of reward. It really isn't rocket science, but it is quite involved. It can be quite complex just in, in the, the range and scope of things that it's concerned with. So it's important that you keep up to date, firstly with your reading, and the core text, Milkovich and Newman, uh, but also that you check your understanding at regular points. Now you'll notice if you have a bit of a look around the, uh, the, the module site on Blackboard uh, that there are various online quizzes uh, at various points uh, through uh, the module and these online quizzes are there for you to check your understanding to make sure that you understand the various bits of the module as we go through it. They're there simply to help so make use of them. Make sure that you're not falling behind or that you're under some kind of misapprehension about the way that one bit or reward uh, operates when actually it might be something quite different. So use the online quizzes to check out your understanding. And if you find in the quizzes uh, you know, that, that your answers are not, uh, are not correct in the quizzes, make sure you go back and, and, and make sure that you understand uh, the process as, as you go along or come and see uh, a tutor to make sure that you can... Uh, make sense of the bit of the module uh, that you're at. Don't fall behind. Key element with this module because of the challenge of the assignment is that you need to keep up to date. So the last thing that you want to do is to move forward uh, into a new bit of the module uh, without properly understanding uh, the bit that you've just left behind. And that's what the quizzes are for, to check that you understand uh, before you move uh, on. So the next kind of uh, session uh, that we're going to have will be uh, a very different type of session, the practical workshops. Now the practical workshops are all focused around the assessment. Every single workshop has relevance and use in terms of the assessment. So attendance at these workshops is absolutely vital. It's also going to be a formal opportunity for you to get, to get together as a team. So if you're not attending, you're not just uh, missing out for yourself, but you're also letting down your team members. And like I said, the team will appraise each other. And that will be taken into account in your final individual mark for the assignment. So the workshops are very important for attendance. The first workshop uh, is to deal with the kinds of issues that we've been talking about today. It's to get to grips with the organisation, about its history, its finance, its culture, its customers, its strategy, 
and to think from there about what strategic reward objectives might be appropriate for the uh, for this organization for for fastcat and to start to think about setting strategic reward uh, objectives now from that session you should then get together in your teams in order to start to write up your reward objectives now all of the support for uh, how you work towards your assessment is available in uh, the workbooks the, the cases and compensation uh, workbooks uh, now uh, writing up your reward objectives is your first task uh, and there are a, a, a number of tools in there that can indicate the kinds of things that you need to consider within uh, setting those reward objectives, most of which we've talked about today. There are a couple of different ones that you won't have seen before, which are quite straightforward. There's a reward strategy uh, and a strategy map. Now, the strategy map in particular is useful because it, it allows you not only to distinguish your particular reward objectives, but also allows you to prioritize your reward objectives. Not all reward objectives are going to have the same importance for the achievement of the organization's business strategy. So you need to make sure that you can identify objectives and their relative priority, their relative important importance for the fast cat uh, organization. Now, when you're setting the objectives, you need to make sure that they are specific, that they meet the needs of the organization's environment, that they support its strategy and that they reflect the organization's values. We're not interested in just some broad, generic objectives. We need objectives that are going to fit the requirements of the organization. Now, let's just take it through to uh, the next uh, key event. You'll notice as we go through that there's uh, readings indicated uh, and another uh, internal, uh, another online quiz. Now, the next element uh, of the module is all about uh, alignment. Uh, now, uh, the alignment uh, element is in two parts. Uh, the first is uh, about the broad issues of alignment as a strategic reward policy. What we're trying to achieve through alignment in terms of workflow, fairness and behaviour, uh, and about the broad, level, broad choices that we have in the way that we design our alignment uh, policies in terms of the numbers of levels that we set out uh, in our internal structure, about the differences between them and that the criteria that we use uh, to distinguish people within the structure, whether that's jobs or whether that's people. Now, uh, we'll go through preparation for uh, next week's session, another set of readings, another online quiz, uh, and then we get a little bit more specific uh, in terms of of our discussion of alignment and we'll look specifically at job-based approaches and skill and competence based approaches and the various methodologies that are associated with them. Now as we work towards uh, the skills workshop uh, you'll see uh, that uh, this, uh, this next workshop is all about starting to put in place uh, practices strategic reward policies that move you towards your strategic uh, objectives uh, for FastCAD. So in uh, phase one uh, of this process, we're interested in internal alignment, about constructing the basis of a job-based uh, internal structure uh, for FastCAD, thinking about compensable factors uh, that we might use to distinguish one job from another to scale those factors to weight them prioritize them and then use that to uh, distinguish a, an internal job-based structure for fast cat jobs now this is one of uh, probably the most time consuming things that you'll do uh, on this module uh, we'll talk about this more in the workshop but you need to make sure that you uh, that you put aside plenty of time uh, for achieving uh, this particular element of the module. Uh, it is quite onerous, so you will need to make sure you work well in that workshop and that you get together in your teams to, uh, to complete that uh, approach. The following workshop uh, will consider person-based uh, approaches. Now, you're not required uh, to do uh, both of these uh, for 
uh, the assignment. You can choose one uh, or the other, uh, but you will have the chance uh, to look at either one uh, in the workshops. But obviously the work that you do in teams, in the workshops and outside of the workshops, you've got a choice uh, about which one uh, you particularly focus uh, upon uh, uh, from your particular perspective on FASCAP's uh, requirements. Uh, as we move through, having done most, both of those uh, workshops, it's important that you begin to, uh, to, to write up uh, the elements of your assignment. Uh, again, it's important to keep up with the process, to not just leave things uh, in kind of note form uh, and to make sure that as we go through uh, that you are writing up uh, your assignment uh, in a fairly complete form. Uh, so that uh, when it comes to pulling the whole thing together at the end, you've already got the main building blocks uh, in place and it only really needs uh, bolting together uh, at the end. Now preparations, as you can see, as we go through uh, and then we uh, move on to another phase uh, of the module, this time dealing with external competitiveness uh, as, a, uh, as, as the next strategic reward policy. Uh, this is uh, reflected in preparation uh, for uh, the next phase and the completion of phase one. Workshops, uh, then we start to think about competitiveness, doing uh, market-based pay surveys uh, and analysis of the data that we construct from that. Uh, we've got access uh, in this module to quite extensive pay pay data held on a database. It's kind of a, a virtual type of, of pay survey, but you will be required to make um, the kinds of decisions that organizations make in terms of the design of a pay survey and to undertake it, to analyze the market data and to make appropriate choices in terms of pay policies, uh, which you'll finish off uh, within uh, your teams and to write uh, that up. Uh, we'll have a further workshop uh, to deal with the issues of integration of the internal structure that we did earlier in the module along with uh, the market-based uh, uh, data. And we move through more preparation and uh, understanding and testing. As we move towards the end of the module, uh, we start to move from these broad issues of structure towards designing uh, uh, systems that uh, reward individual employee contribution, individual pay schemes, whether they are uh, merit pay schemes, lump sum schemes, uh, uh, incentives of various types. Uh, and, uh, and this will get uh, built upon in your teams uh, and uh, in uh, the, uh, the supporting uh, workshops. The final uh, elements of the, of the module are all about pulling uh, these elements uh, together. We'll hold a session towards the end of the module which allow you to deal uh, with any outstanding issues, or any outstanding confusions. Uh, and to make sure that there's nothing left unanswered uh, before uh, you're left uh, to, uh, to pull your, your assignment uh, together uh, for uh, submission uh, towards uh, the end. So this is the, uh, the structure of the, of the module. Uh, like I say, there are a variety of different types of session and there are lots of different types of activities. I can't stress strongly enough about the importance of keeping up to date uh, on uh, the module, not falling behind. Uh, people who fall behind uh, invariably struggle. Uh, so it's important that you manage your time, both individually and in your teams, uh, to make sure uh, that you keep up to date, that you check your understanding, that you do your preparation, uh, that you use the podcasts and you use the online quizzes, and you lose, use the other resources uh, so that you don't... Uh, get stuck and you don't get lost uh, because that is where people run into most uh, difficulties uh, on uh, the module. So that's the module as a whole uh, and this uh, effectively brings uh, to an end uh, the, uh, uh, the session uh, here uh, today introducing 
uh, the module. So I wish you good luck uh, and I'll see you at the next session.